Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Ireland's First Sex Scandal. In the 1880s, the politician Charles Stuart Parnell was an almost legendary figure in Ireland. Known as the Uncrowned King, his reputation was well established across the world. While he was the most famous Irish person of the age, however, his downfall was truly spectacular. In 1890, Parnell became embroiled in a sex scandal that gripped the English-speaking world. The sensational story of this scandal that broke at the height of the Victorian era is the fascinating story covered in this episode. Now, to explain the scandal, I'm joined by Dr. Lloyd Maeve Houston. Lloyd is an academic, and their book, Irish Modernism and the Politics of Sexual Health, looks at the pivotal role this incident played in Irish society and formed ideas around sexual health. You can read articles written by Lloyd at their website, lmhouston.co.uk. There's lots of content there. I have links to it in the show notes below, but that link is lmhouston.co.uk. As I say, it's well worth checking out. But to begin our conversation, I asked Lloyd to give you a background to Parnell. As you'll hear... Parnell's backstory is crucial in terms of understanding the scandal. To give a, the most whistle-stop tour of, of Parnell that I can, he's he's born in 1846 in Avondale House in County Wicklow to an Anglo-Irish father and an American mother who meet and marry in, in, in New York. They're a sort of well-liked, albeit sort of debt-ridden landlord family. There, there seem to be good landlords, quote-unquote. And they have a family history of sort of involvement in liberal politics, which is not all that surprising for people of, of their, their sort of background. But what is perhaps slightly more surprising is there's also a sort of anti-English or, you know, kind of there, there's a nationalist sentiment that, that that's um, in, in the last few sort of generations of their family leading up to Parnell that also shapes his sort of political thinking. And it looks like he's all set to sort of follow in this tradition in a fairly unassuming way until he um, kind of belatedly stands for election as an MP for the Home Rule League, as was in 1875. And he kind of makes a fairly rapid, I mean, he has a really unprepossessing start. He he makes a, a series of kind of very just poorly executed speeches. He has a sort of weird, quite shrill voice. Apparently. But he, he eventually sort of aligns himself with those who support a policy of parliamentary obstruction and land agitation. And he sort of strategically endears himself to the Fenian movement through his willingness to kind of antagonize Westminster. He's not there to kind of make friends in the way that maybe um, some better established members of the party are. And he experiences a pretty rapid rise to power. So he assumes leadership of the League in 1880, following the death of Isaac Butt, who is the sort of um, predecessor in, in the role. And he kind of relaunches the League as the Irish Parliamentary Party in 1882. Now, Parnell's rise is really linked to the Land War and the Land League, a tenants' rights movement in the late 1870s and early 1880s. Lloyd continues the story. You know, his leadership of the Land League, which he establishes in, in 1879, his support for boycotting. He doesn't kind of mint the term, but he, you know, he sort of gives it one of its more sort of concrete articulations. Campaigns of like no rent where, you know, tenants would withhold rent payments. That campaign leads to his imprisonment in Kilmainham Jail in 1881 to 82. And there's a sort of surge of agrarian violence in, 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 while he's imprisoned that uh, is, is sort of ascribed or attributed to him, but it's not really necessarily clear how directly under his control that is. But he he emerges and then kind of manages to steer quite a careful course between sort of cozying up to the, the, the Tory and Liberal parties in the um, close run 1885 election. And that kind of culminates or allows him to sort of pull off the, the first Home Rule Bill in 1886, which is defeated in Parliament, but is a you know, kind of major achievement in terms of getting that on the agenda. So by the late 1880s, Parnell had cemented himself as a major figure in both Britain and Ireland. While the sex scandal would break in 1891, he was not a man adverse to controversy. His opponents had tried to bring him down in a sensational conspiracy of sorts in 1887. There's the sort of pigot forgery scandal of 1887, which saw the Times falsely accuse Parnell of endorsing the 1882 Phoenix Park murders on the basis of some counterfeit letters. And then there's a parliamentary commission that sort of exonerates him of this very publicly. And so by this kind of period of like 1887, like toward the end of the 1880s, Parnell is in this pretty kind of unassailable position of authority and popularity. So he comes to enjoy immense popular support from across the Irish social and political spectrum, not just from the 
sort of you know traditional kind of constituencies that would support nationalism but also from you know kind of landlords and you know sort of members of the the, the quote unquote sort of protestant ascendancy and so on and he's lauded as the chief and the uncrowned king of ireland in terms of understanding the downfall of Parnell, though, it's crucial to understand how he was perceived in wider Irish society. In the 1880s, he was a very modern politician in that he carefully crafted an image, a myth around himself. With the support of the nationalist press, he sort of cultivates throughout all this a, a public image, which comes to be sort of referred to as the Parnell myth, that frames him as preternaturally kind of aloof reserved and disdainful of popular opinion and this sort of speaks to a, a sort of odd paradox paradox within um, parnellism which david Wan was referred to as its status as a highly popular form of anti-populism so parnell enjoys huge popular support precisely because he's seen to not court popular opinion he is you know, kind of the, the myth kind of encapsulates this, right? It's a widely disseminated and media friendly image of Parnell as a figure so self possessed as to give seemingly no consideration to the influence of, or opinion of others. And that kind of image of Parnell as intensely self possessed has, uh, as I suggest in, in my own sort of work, kind of under examined sexual implications. That he was perceived in this way was no accident. Parnell and his supporters carefully crafted this image. He's one of the first politicians to really leverage the kind of networks of mass media that modernity sort of brings with it in strategic ways. And what you see is this sort of recurring set of like tropes and phrases around Parnell that kind of crop up in all the biographical journalistic or literary writing about him right so he's he's talked about as being sort of impassively uh, impassive rock-like calm silent and restrained the least agitated of agitators the lock mouth master of loose-lipped men he's encased in steel he's the embodiment of a kind of imperturbable serenity iron resolution and impenetrable reserve so like W.B. Yeats in his youth um, or in one of his autobiographies talks about the sort of fascination that Parnell held for him. And he, he has this anecdote about how anytime Parnell stayed in a hotel, if any of his sort of subordinates arrived at the same hotel and realized he was staying there, they would like go to a different hotel. So it was not to sort of violate the, you know, heroic autonomy of the man. Um, although also, I mean, given what happened, what emerges after the, the sort of O'Shea and divorce scandal, there's maybe other resonances to this, you know, sense of um, Parnell in, in hotels possessing this kind of potency that, that means that no other man can come near him. Given we're going to talk about a sex scandal, Lloyd explained some of the sexual components to Parnell's image. He cast himself as a celibate man married only to Ireland. One of the th the strengths of the Irish Parliamentary Party in this period is that there are a lot of journalists in it there and and lawyers and you know people who are in a position to kind of cultivate this this rhetoric around Parnell and yeah what what you see are the sort of seedings of of, of you know and the kind of propagation of anecdotes that kind of emphasize this like there's a story about him like passing his own brother in the street and refusing to acknowledge him which um because like apparently even to like have a brother would be you know somehow a kind of diminution of or he gives him like a kind of wink or something but it's uh you know he's he's too sort of untouchable this framing of parnell as as kind of an avatar of masculine self-possession and possessed of you know these sort of strong passions strongly checked to use um, Joe Valente's language is bound up with a sort of suggestion of of a kind of celibacy right that he, that he is not going to kind of de demean himself through the, the kind of perceived contaminations of, of of sexual desire right so you know th there are stories that sort of circulate and that again seem to be kind of cultivated Parnell by Parnell around you know his, his kind of bachelorhood and the fact that he can kind of best serve Ireland that he's asked you know why he does not marry and an interview says you know I, I I'm married to Ireland and can best serve her as I am i.e that you know his refusal of a relationship on the sort of terrestrial plane allows him to you know serve Erin on a, on a on a sort of higher plane uh, it, it has its basis in a sort of real life experience but you know there, there's a kind of early heartbreak involving an, an American heiress that gets kind of capitalized on so there's an article in the London Leader for example in 1888 that sort of talks about this in a really kind of 
intense way. The Irish people know that under that cold face beats a heart which throbs with love for Ireland. He is indeed the uncrowned King of Ireland, loved with a love and followed with a fidelity which no leader has commanded since the days of Hero O'Donnell. There is a kind of shadowy tradition that in early manhood, Charlie Parnell was crossed in love. He certainly has not been crossed in love since he took off his coat to fight the Battle of Ireland. She has been his queen, his mistress, the only love of his heart, his dark Rosaline. Now, obviously, there's a whole set of tropes there being, you know, the dark Rosaline kind of gives the game away in terms of like the debts this owes to the poetry of someone like James Clarence Mangan. And, you know, this this idea of a hero foregoing real life intimacy in order to serve a, a kind of idealized Ireland that is as old as the hills. Um, and Parnell is just putting a, a particular kind of advantageous contemporary spin on it. But it is one that certainly kind of frames him as or makes legible the ways that this kind of self-possession is tied in with questions of of sex and and the kind of regulation of sex so you you'll have heard there in that kind of talk of you know how under that cold face beats a heart which throbs with love there's a sense that parnell's kind of celibate you know bachelor restraint does not mean that parnell is lacking in kind of virility right he is that, that there is underneath this surface, there's a roiling kind of potent energy um, that is that is you know being contained, but in a kind of deliberate and self possessed way. While Parnell projected this image and went to extraordinary lengths to create the myth, the reality of his life was unsurprisingly very different. Parnell had been conducting a relationship for nearly a decade, and when this broke into the open, it scandalised the Victorian world behind the scenes from around 1880 things are quite different <laughs> uh, yeah in in that year he first meets and very quickly becomes infatuated with and involved with um, a woman called Catherine at, well at that point she's Catherine O'Shea and Catherine O'Shea is she is married to Captain William O'Shea who is a member of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Um, he's MP for County Clare. He and his wife have been sort of amiably separated for quite a few years by the time um, Parnell meets Catherine. So, you know, they, they, they've had like three children together and in the manner of respectable marriages of this day, they they drift apart, but, you know, they don't bring the publicity that like divorce would, you know, they're, they're just functionally separated. And but they're on good enough terms that Catherine is keen to advance her husband's career because you know in, in ways that I suppose also benefit her. And to that end, she arranges to meet with Parnell in the aftermath of the the eighteen eighty elections and invites him to to a dinner. He is unable to attend, so eventually she goes to Westminster and and meets him in a, a sort of courtyard. And you know apparently the the spark is, is is sort of near instant. And very shortly thereafter, they they commence an affair. Now. Affair is a very charged word that I think, you know, in, in our view, um, or carries with it connotations of, you know, kind of secrecy and sort of emotional intensity. Um, and there are shades of that. I mean, O'Shea is initially, Captain O'Shea is initially not terribly happy about this, allegedly sort of challenges Parnell to a duel and so on. But for a variety of, through a combination of sort of self-interest um, as much as anything, partly to advance his own political career and partly because, um, possibly because Catherine is due to inherit a great deal of money from a, a wealthy aunt. He sort of makes his peace with this. And so for most of the 1880s, Parnell and Catherine live a, a kind of relationship that is an open secret in Westminster circles, right? It's the subject of kind of gossip in in in, in London it's alluded to in the press very obliquely occasionally, but functionally, they, you know, they keep a house together in in, in Eltham in London. They have three children. Um, the, the first is stillborn to survive. And, you know, they live a fairly sedate um, kind of, you know, functionally married life or, you know, they're, they're two people in a long term partnership. And it's pretty evident that that O'Shea connives in this. Right. He he is he's aware of it he does nothing to kind of stop it um past a certain point you know and in that sense there's something uh, among the many things that the eventual revelation of this does it also just kind of humanizes parnell in in, in ways that you know like uh, catherine eventually produces a sort of you know biography of their relationship where she reproduces love letters from parnell where you know he's every inch the kind of wooing schoolboy, you know this this immensely kind of taciturn self 
self-possessed man, you know, consistently refers to as Queenie, you know, so it's, there, there's something quite humanizing about that. But obviously, that open secret can only remain an open secret so long as O'Shea doesn't pursue a divorce. And for a variety of factors that it, it's still a sort of subject of speculation, quite what tips his hand, but something to do with a feeling that he can no longer extract anything kind of politically valuable from the situation, but also the fact that um, it becomes clear he won't inherit, he won't have access to this money that Catherine stood to inherit leads him to bring a divorce suit in the dying days of 1889. So it's like sort of in the run up to Christmas, basically it's in December that he brings this suit. Now Parnell did not contest the accusation. And as Lloyd explains, this would leave a huge vacuum, which was filled by sensational newspaper speculation. Through his unwillingness to kind of contest that, Parnell holds back a lot of information that might exculpate things. So he doesn't sort of stress O'Shea's kind of connivance in this. And so that leaves a lot of room for press speculation. So there's like all these sort of, you know, stories about like Parnell climbing down fire escapes to kind of escape from being discovered in Catherine's room or all of these sort of like, you know, various uh, sort of aliases he has to use, like Fox and Prescott and so on. His previous image was in this context easily turned on its head and used against Parnell. All of this stuff now kind of becomes a huge problem for Parnell, right? So the the propensity for sort of unknowability now becomes a kind of malign secrecy, right? A sort of sordid, you know, kind of hiding of, of, of shameful deeds. And his restraint is now kind of in tatters, right? You know, the, the, the idea of him as someone who is self-possessed is completely gone, right? He is prey to his desires. It was often thought that the Catholic Church led the charge against Parnell, but in fact they were far more cautious and waited to see how other forces reacted, as Lloyd now explains. Many figures within his circle who want to continue the cause of Irish kind of nationalism are now in quite a difficult position. The Parnell scandal is perhaps most familiar in popular culture through James Joyce's sort of rendering of it in a portrait of the artist where it seems like it's the catholic church that initially comes from parnell that's a bit of a misrepresentation what kind of actually happens is that it's um the liberal party is very dependent on the sort of so-called non-conformist conscience and you know sort of it's actually english sort of protestant opinion that turns first and then once it becomes clear for the liberals that they can't maintain their kind of support base if they support parnell they go which makes the Irish Parliamentary Party go. And then it's actually the Catholic Church who are, as in so many things, schnaky. <laughs> you know, they they are, it's only when they see that, oh, this is non-viable or, you know, the public opinion pretty uniformly has turned here that they then begin to denounce Parnell from the pulpit. But they were actually fairly sort of reserved initially. But collectively, what you see is a sort of outpouring of, of, of increasingly sort of scandalised rhetoric around Parnell. And this prompts a split in the Irish Parliamentary Party. It kind of comes to a head in a kind of committee room in Westminster where a sizable minority of the party remain loyal to him, but the majority kind of painfully accept that he is too compromised. I mean, they're in an unenviable position because they have to choose between abandoning their leader and being seen to kowtow to English popular opinion and standing up for a man who is, in the logic of the day, you know, kind of immoral. And so they choose what they think is the more sort of politically expedient option, which is to privilege the liberal alliance and the possibility of home rule over the the man. The political split fueled one of the most bitter divides in late 19th century Irish politics. Lloyd now explains how the rhetoric used against Parnell was highly sexualized. One of the the most striking things about the rhetoric that's used to critique Parnell. To my mind, in the aftermath of, of this split in, in the Irish Parliamentary Party, is its kind of insistently sexualized and medicalized um, kind of register. So the architect of much of the sort of anti parnellite rhetoric is a, a fellow called Timothy Healy, who was a sort of fairly senior figure in the party's a solicitor and a, and, a, and a newspaper owner. And he establishes a sort of new paper to go after Parnell. And through editorials and speeches, um, Healy consistently frames Parnell as this kind of congenitally unstable sort of sex maniac. It's it, it, and, and it's really, you know, again, given that this is a sort of 
a, a scandal that's premised upon moral purity or, you know, this this kind of idea that this offends against the purity of the Irish and that sex, you know, is a, is a sort of undiscussable or, or taboo topic. Healy exposes the sort of paradox of that, which is that in order to kind of rail against someone for sexual misconduct, your rhetoric becomes very um, sort of explicitly sexual. So, you know, he talks about Parnell. There, there's, well, it's actually a, a, a friend of Healy's who writes for the, the New York Times sort of sets things off talking about, you know, is Parnell a crazy man and how he's succumbed to this sort of hereditary predisposition toward mental disturbance. Healy talks about Parnell kind of as this like diseased Lothario who is only to be found in kind of yonic caves and, da- you know, damp places. And he sort of diagnoses him. He says, you know, if we have to explain where Mr. Parnell has been, um, you know, I have a diagnosis for you and it's Kitty on the brain. Kitty being a b- both, you know, kind of the, the uh, Hiberno-English sort of contraction of Catherine, but also a, a contemporary sort of byword for a, a sex worker. And this sense of Kitty on the brain both speaks to the way in which his judgment has been compromised by desire. This became bound up in the conceptions of sexual health at the time. Lloyd's work focuses a lot on the impact of this on the scandal. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that sexual health was viewed very differently in the 19th century. What we understand as sexual health today is generally focused on the well-being of the individual. But in the 19th century, it had a very different meaning. When people talked about concepts around sexual health, they were concerned with societal issues and how sex affected the wider population In this context, Parnell's opponents compared him to the threat posed to wider society by syphilis. In my work, I I, I sort of explore how that suggestion of kind of mental disease and it's uh, that that's propagated by sex is very resonant with kind of contemporary understandings of of syphilis, right, or a contemporary sort of discourse around syphilis. Like, long story short. Syphilis is in this period is thought of as being well, it, I mean, it literally is sort of congenital, it can be passed on, not just through sexual contact, but it can also um, be passed on sort of in utero. So a child born to a syphilitic mother can experience all of the sort of, you know, symptoms thereof. And those symptoms in sort of advanced forms of syphilis, particularly if it affects your mind or your, you know, kind of sort of cerebrospinal um, sort of system, can kind of result in what what's called general paralysis of the insane, which is this state of sort of it's akin to dementia, basically. But it um, it's it's often discussed in terms of kind of leading people to become a increasingly sort of unrestrained in their behavior, but also kind of increasingly megalomaniacal. And Healy sort of leverages this, this kind of characterization of Parnell as, you know, this, this growing sort of megalomaniac who has no capacity to control himself and sort of exploits it both to frame Parnell as on the one hand, a sort of hereditary sex maniac, right? He's kind of inherited this, this whole, you know, predisposition toward mental disturbance, but also to kind of frame Parnell as like a vector for sexual infection. As Lloyd explains, while Parnell had used sexualized imagery to project his myth, his detractors, led by Tim Healy, used the same logic against him. This kind of culminates in Healy using essentially the kind of same logic uh, uh, that, that underpinned the Parnell myth, this image of, you know, kind of health being a kind of hygienic masculine virility to kind of, you know, call for Ireland erect and in its strength to, you know, kind of pl- purge from its system the corrupting humour that uh, that Parnell is trying to kind of infuse it with. So there's, you know, it, not all of this is kind of out and out sexual health rhetoric per se, but my argument is that if, if you sort of look at it in toto and if you kind of situate all of this medical kind of discourse of corruption and infection and so on in relation to the inherently sexual nature of Parnell's perceived transgressions. What emerges is this really lurid kind of picture of, you know, Parnell as, you know, a kind of like Dorian Gray or Dr. Jekyll figure, you know, this kind of corrupt sexual menace that because he is understood to be almost kind of consubstantial with the nation, right? There there are times where, you know, he talks about how Mr. Parnell and Ireland might be used as, con- you know, in- interchangeable terms. If Ireland is the body, or if, if Parnell is the body politic, and Parnell's body is this corrupt, then it's only by, you know, the kind of sanitary measure of excising Parnell that Ireland can kind of, you know, maintain its capacity for sort of self-rule. And so Parnell has to go. Parnell's defence was somewhat unusual. Some of his leading defenders, such as George Bernard Shaw, 
rather than try and move the debate away from sex, actually leaned into it. As you say, there is a, a sort of paradox here where you might imagine that Parnell's defenders or those speaking in, in his defense would be keen to just downplay the question of sex at all. But that's not necessarily always what happens. So, you know, one of the people sort of who, who does jump to Parnell's defense is George Bernard Shaw, who in a couple of sort of open letters that he publishes in, in a, a sort of liberal newspaper, talks about how the case, all the, the case of Parnell does is expose the sort of deficiencies of divorce law in England and the need to kind of reform that that law. And the kind of defense Shaw Mounts is very much rooted in what we would now kind of understand as, as a sort of eugenic model of, of sort of public health. So he sort of talks about how while while the Parnell case is being kind of obsessed about by morbidly sexual members of the of the press. So he's already framing them as kind of, you know, sexually kind of compromised in in the same ways that they're suggesting Parnell is. But actually, all it really does is expose the need to reform divorce law because Parnell in pursuing this relationship with Catherine is pursuing a, you know, kind of healthy and natural relationship and that attempts to kind of, you know, force people into or confine people to relationships that are that are unhappy will act against public health. Uh, he sort of uses the, the the term public health. And so Shaw's argument is basically that it, they're kind of in the interest of public health. Parnell should, you know, someone like Parnell should be free to remarry or, well, Catherine should be free to remarry. Parnell should be free to marry her and that he should just let the pure people talk. The difficulty I think that Parnell has is that that maybe Shaw has is that the pure people are talking, but they're they're using the same rhetoric, <laughs> um, and so everyone is sort of using similar insinuations and accusations against each other. Right? Shaw is trying to defend Parnell from the accusation that he is sort of morbidly sexual by calling other people morbidly sexual for so obsessing about the sexual conduct of a figure like Parnell. Now Parnell himself died somewhat suddenly in eighteen ninety one at a relatively young age. However, the scandal would divide Irish politics for years afterwards. The rift over the issue was only healed in 1900. However, the legacy of the scandal continued long after this and had a profound impact on Irish history. Lloyd has written a book about sexual health and wider Irish politics, which they explain here. So the book is Irish Modernism and the Politics of Sexual Health. And I, I hope, you know, you can see through all we've talked about how, how those two questions are sort of intertwined. But essentially, it offers a kind of cultural history of discourse and debate around sexual health and the kind of politicised role that sexual health plays as a concept and a subject of debate in Irish political and kind of cultural life from about 1880, so from sort of, you know, the emergence of Parnell through to about 1960. And in the course of that, I sort of survey various sort of particularly charged moments in the history of the relationship between sex, health and politics in Ireland. So you start with, you know, the Parnell split, then sort of look at the Playboy riots. I look at sort of efforts to kind of police and regulate <clears throat> venereal disease in Ireland, but also the ways that, you know, movements like Sinn Féin kind of capitalize on the presence of venereal disease in the British army uh, as a kind of stick to beat them with. You know, it's basically like a statistical index of how, quote unquote, immoral the English are. Then, you know, look at the passage of the Censorship of Publications Act, which obviously, again, as, as, as your audience may know, prohibits all printed material relating to birth control and abortion. And so becomes a centerpiece, not just for debates about kind of literary culture and what is and isn't, you know, permitted to be read, but also becomes a debate basically about whether or not birth control should be permitted in Ireland, what the kind of implications of that are for the health and strength and size of the Irish population in ways that literary figures exploit um, to kind of, you know, position themselves in the emergent sort of free state. I carry that on into kind of looking at that in relation to particularly kind of women's responses to that debate, which I think have gone kind of underdocumented. The, the writing of Kate O'Brien is quite interesting for this. The sort of study concludes looking at um, Flann O'Brien's engagement with this and the ways that his work, particularly in the sort of 1960s, when notionally Ireland is experiencing a period of sort of modernization and liberalization, um, he sort of weirdly nostalgically circles back to like the the 1890s in his writing and kind of restages a lot of these debates in sort of weirdly exhausted forms. And so I sort of conclude by thinking about the ways in which sexual health in, in that phase of sort of Irish cultural history has become 
at once a kind of exhausted topic that seems to belong to a previous moment, but also that retains this kind of sort of political potency that ca- somehow can't be vanquished. And even as, you know, kind of the debate around sort of sex and Irish writing moves on to people like Edna O'Brien's writing, you know, Country Girls and all the, the, the sort of scandal that surrounds that, that questions of sort of sexual health, as, as well we know, kind of remain inexhaustibly sort of relevant to sort of this weird zombie rhetoric that can't quite be killed. You can get Lloyd's book at the links in the show notes below. I will say it's an academic text, so that puts it on the pricier side. But if you want to read more of Lloyd's work, check out their website at lmhouston.co.uk. There's loads to read there. So that link is lmhouston.co.uk. I have links to that in the show notes below as well. Sound on today's show was by Kate Dunley. That's where I'm going to leave it for this week, folks. Until next time, Sloan.